Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Ashwara Sitaram from the Biocon Investor Relations team. And I would like to welcome you to Biocon's earnings call for Q3 FY22. I'd like to indicate that all participants will be in the listen only mode, and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the opening remarks conclude. Should you need to raise questions, please select the raise hand option under the reactions tab of your Zoom application. We will call out your name and unmute your line to enable you to ask the question. While asking, please begin with your name and your organization. Please note that we will not be monitoring any questions on the chat box, but you can raise any technical concerns that you may be facing for our support team to help. I'd also like to bring to your attention that this conference is being recorded. To discuss the company's business performance and outlook, we have with us today, the Biocon leadership team comprising of Dr. Kiran Majumdar Shaw, our executive chairperson, and other senior management colleagues. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to also remind everyone about Safe Harbor. Today's discussion may be forward-looking in nature based on management's current beliefs and expectations. It must be viewed in concurrence with the risks that our business faces that could cause our future results, performance, or achievements to differ significantly from what is expressed or implied by such forward-looking statements. At the end of this call, if you need any further information or clarifications, please do get in touch with Nikon Jormi. I would now like to turn the call over to Dr. Kiran Majumdar Shaw. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Aishwarya, and good morning, everyone. I welcome you to Biocon's earnings call for the third quarter of FY22. Let me start this earnings call <clears throat> with warm wishes for a happy, healthy, and hopeful 2022. As I reflect on the year that went by, I recall the optimism at the start of 2021 with a flurry of vaccine approvals and signs of the pandemic receding. However, this was short-lived with the Delta variant delivering a devastating second wave, thwarting the global economy, which was just beginning to recover. Vaccines were deployed across the world to attain levels of protection that would enable revival. When it seemed like the pandemic was reaching an endemic stage, yet another strain of the virus, Omicron, emerged. Omicron, while three times more transmissible than the former variant Delta, seems to be far less severe with low hospitalization and death rates. While the outcome of this variant is yet to be seen, mass immunization through vaccination or boosters, an expanded therapeutic arsenal, and lessons from the earlier waves will help blunt the impact of Omicron. This, however, may not be the last variant and we as a community need to brace ourselves for more variants in the future and continue to adhere to COVID appropriate protocols. Pediatric trials need to be sped up so that children can also soon get protective immunity. I also encourage everyone to take booster doses when available. The need for vaccines has never been stronger as the world continues to battle infectious diseases. As you are aware, <clears throat> Biocon Biologics has recently formed a strategic alliance with Serum Institute, enabling it to enter the vaccine space. Collaboration such as this, along with our existing COVID portfolio, will enable us to continue to be at the forefront in the fight against COVID-19. Biocon remains committed to provide a comprehensive solution of affordable therapeutics for global healthcare. Let me move to the next slide, where I will now start uh, discussing the key highlights for Q3 FY22. Let me take you through a few of these. For the first time, we entered the prestigious Dow Jones Sustainability Index in the emerging market category for our progressive environmental, social, and governance, or ESG practices. We made a formal submission for corporate sustainability assessment for listing on the DJSI 
and made it to the Emerging Markets Index with a total sustainability score of 45 as against an industry average of 18, achieving a 93 percentile. We also secured an, secured an improved carbon disclosure project rating of B from C, which earlier, as per their 2021 report. We are working to establish a strong ESG framework that can endure the test of time and stakeholder expectations whilst enhancing our responsible corporate citizenship. Biocon has been selected to participate in the government's production-linked incentive scheme 2.0 for the pharmaceutical sector. Under the scheme, Biocon will receive financial incentives of up to 250 crores over a period of six years, linked to investments in manufacturing, infrastructure, and corresponding incremental sales of pharmaceutical goods. Several companies that applied for the scheme, and we were among the 55 companies that were selected based on parameters such as manufacturing investments over the last 10 years, number of regulatory approvals, R&D spends as a percentage of manufacturing revenue, et cetera. I would now like to turn to certain management updates. Biocon Biologics has appointed Matthew Eric as the Chief Commercial Officer, Advanced Markets. Matthew's appointment reflects our strategic intent to build commercial capabilities in the advanced markets of North America, Europe, Australia, and New Zealand. Matthew will be based out of the US. A second management update relates to Dr. Mandar Ghatnekar, who has been appointed as Chief Digital Transformation Officer at Biocon Biologics and will be leading their IT and digital solutions initiatives. Ajit Pal Singh has joined us at Biocon Biologics as Head Branded Formulations India. Ajit will be responsible for spearheading near-term plans and long-term strategic investments for existing, our existing portfolio, as well as building brands to drive sustainable growth. I will now move, you, uh, move on to the financial performance of this quarter. At a consolidated group level, revenues for Q3 FY22 were 2,223 crores versus 1,885 crores, a year-on-year -year growth of 18%, and a sequential growth of 14%. Revenues from our biosimilars business delivered a robust year-on-year -year growth of 28%, while that of our research services business grew by 10%, and generics revenues grew by 7%. We recorded a forex gain of 19 crores this quarter as compared to six crores during Q3 FY21. A loss of 77 crores arising on account of mark to market loss on Biocon Biologics investment in Adagio Therapeutics is reported for the quarter. We also recorded a gross R&D spend of 178 crores for this quarter which corresponds to 12% of revenue ex -SYNG. Of this, 138 crores has been expensed in PL, PL, while the balance amount has been capitalized. Core EBITDA margins, that is EBITDA margins net of licensing, Forex, mark-to-market loss on Adagio investment and R&D stood at 33% compared to 31% in the same quarter last year. This is on account of an improved performance in both biosimilars and generics. EBITDA for the quarter was 537 crores, a 25% year-on-year growth. The EBITDA margin stood at 24% as against 23% reported in Q3 FY21. Profit before tax or PBT for the quarter stood at 269 crores, up 14%, uh, uh, versus 236 crores during the same quarter of last fiscal. Net profit for the quarter stood at 187 crores versus 169 crores in Q3, a growth of 11%. However, if we adjust for the mark-to-market loss on investment in Adagio, 
our EBITDA, uh, EBITDA during the quarter would be 614 crores, reflecting an EBITDA margin of 28% as against the reported margin of 24% previous uh, uh, margin of 24%. Profit before tax for the quarter would be 346 crores as against the reported 269 crores. Let me now turn to the performance of our business segments during the quarter. Let me start with generics. The generics segment delivered quarterly revenues of 607 crores, indicating a sequential growth of 15% and a year-on-year -year growth of 7%. Profit before tax for the quarter stood at 67 crores versus 53 crores in the same period last year. And PBT margins were up 11% as against 9% in the previous fiscal. The business saw a robust sequential growth due to the successful launch of our vertically integrated complex formulation Evrolimus in the US, which was also a day one launch for its 10 milligram strength. We also had a good uptick in our API business. The launch of Everolimus was also a key driver in the year-on-year -year growth of the segment. And since the launch, the product has gained traction and we expect that this product will continue to contribute to the growth of our generics portfolio. During the quarter operations, which had been impacted due to COVID-related challenges in previous quarters, started normalizing. However, the business continued to face pricing pressure headwinds in, uh, 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 pricing pressure headwinds in various markets. While margins improved for the quarter, there was an impact on profitability due to higher raw material costs, particularly solvents, and higher costs of logistics. I think this has been felt across industries. During the quarter, we also continue to make progress on our product part pipeline. Following the remote interactive evaluation conducted by the US FDA in the last quarter for our oral, oral solid dosage manufacturing facility in Bengaluru, we received an AMD approval for mycophenolic acid delayed release tablet at the end of November. During the quarter, we also received the dossier approval for Everolimus tablets and Pingolimod capsules for the EU market. In line with one of our strategic priorities to expand our presence in newer geographies, we signed a partnering deal with Tabuk Pharmaceuticals to commercialize several specialty generic medicines in the Middle East and North Africa region. This is an important milestone for Biocon as we strengthen our commitment to provide affordable healthcare for patients around the globe. Our Greenfield Immunosuppressants API manufacturing facility in Vishakhapatnam remains on track to be commissioned in FY22 with qualification and validation in FY23. As we add new capacities, accelerate new product launches in key markets supported by our efforts for driving cost efficiencies, we expect continued growth in the quarters to come. Now let me turn to biosimilars. Biocon Biologics recorded revenues of 981 crores for Q3, a year-on-year -year growth of 28%, and a sequential growth of 32%. EBITDA for the quarter was up 12% year-on-year at 236 crores. This includes a mark-to-market loss of the 77 crores made from the investment in Adagio at its IPO. Core EBITDA, including R&D, Forex, licensing income, and mark-to-market loss on Adagio investment, stood at 363 crores, which is up 27% year-on-year. Core EBITDA margin was at 38% for the quarter, in line with the same period last year, demonstrating our ability to profitably grow this business. Profit before tax, excluding the mark-to-market loss on the Adagio investment, stood at 201 crores, which is up 82% year-on-year. The strong growth in revenue and profits are backed by robust demand across products and geographies. 
We launched our 351K biosimilar insulin glargine in the US, paving the way for interchangeable biosimilars in the region. The US Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit has ruled in favor of our partner Beatrice on all the five Sanofi Lantus Solostar device patents, vindicating our long-held position on intellectual property. We expect significant uptake of the product in the US evidenced by several commercial arrangements already in place. Assembly has received preferred status in the national formularies of key PBMs, including Express Scripts and Prime Therapeutics, and will also be offered through Walgreens Prescription Savings Club. Beatrice has established a range of options to support patients such as patient assistance and co-pay programs. We continue to see gradual improvement in the market share of Ogivri in the US, which was pegged at 11.4% in December. It continues to be a leading biosimilar trastuzumab in Australia and Canada. We are witnessing growth from Europe with steady improvement in performance in the markets where Beatrice is present. We have seen impressive growth in the Biocon Biologics-led commercial franchise in emerging markets. We have made good progress on our strategy of entering new markets, enabling sustainable growth in our B2B business. For example, we have forged commercial partnerships for biosimilar bevacizumab in about 20 countries post the EMA approval in April 2021. The branded formulations India business, which is our front-end commercial engine in India, continues to see healthy growth with nine months revenues for FY22 exceeding the full year FY21 revenue. We continue to progress our wave two R&D pipeline and expect some of them to enter the clinic this quarter. Encouraged by the demand for our current insulins globally and the pipeline ahead of us, we have initiated investments for the expansion of our insulin manufacturing facility in Malaysia. Our strategic alliance with Serum Institute Life Sciences, which involves a merger of Covishield Technologies Private Limited into Biocon Biologics with effect from 1st October 2022, is on track. We will be submitting the relevant regulatory filings this month. To summarize, the strong performance of the biosimilars business underpinned by its robust business fundamentals validates its long-term potential. There are multiple near-term catalysts, such as revenues from the Vaccines Alliance with Serum Institute and the US launch of biosimilar bevacizumab, aspart, and adalimumab in the future, which will further propel the business. Now coming to novel programs. Equilium, our US-based partner, is on track to initiate a pivotal study in early 2022 for the use of itulizumab in first-line treatment of acute graft-versus-host disease. Equilium is also conducting a proof-of-concept study for its use in lupus SLE or lupus nephritis. Um, SLE is an autoimmune chronic inflammatory disease with over 100,000 patients in the US and over 45,000 patients in India, many of whom do not respond to standard available therapy of steroids and immunosuppressive drugs. We believe if itulizumab can address this unmet need with better remission rates, more durable responses, and a better safety profile. Our clinical strategy for itulizumab was further supported by the recent publication of a manuscript in the Journal of Clinical Investigation, highlighting the contribution of CD6 Alcam path pathway in lupus nephritis. After observing positive trends in the part A of its phase 1B equalized study for SLE and LN or lupus nephritis indication, Equilium has also now expanded the Part B portion to clinical centers in India after obtaining approval from the Drugs Controller General of India. During the quarter, our Boston-based associate, Vicara Therapeutics, completed enrollment for the dose-finding part of the Phase 1 trial for its lead program 
BC one A, uh, BCA one hundred one as a single agent and in combination with the PD one inhibitor. Bicara established all doses tested to be safe and tolerable for both monotherapy and in combination, and is on track to open three expansion cohorts at the start of twenty twenty two. I now turn to our subsidiary Sinjin, which uh, hosts our research services business. Revenue from operations stood at six forty one crores for the quarter, indicating a year on year growth of ten percent. Profit before tax for the quarter increased by ten percent year on year to one twenty eight crores. Discovery services and the dedicated centers were three key growth drivers, while development services and manufacturing services delivered sustained performances. A significant milestone for Sinjin in the dedicated centers was the extension and expansion of the long-standing multidisciplinary research collaboration with Amgen until the end of 2026. Last year, BMS also extended their contract by 10 years. This confirms the stability of both relationships and demonstrates the strategic value that Sinjin provides to help their partners build successful pipelines. Sinjin is well positioned to meet the evolving requirements of the client, and the company has raised their revenue growth guidance for Q4 and for the full year from mid to high teens. I would now like to conclude my remarks. by saying that we are tracking well across our businesses and we are confident that we will end this fiscal on a strong growth trajectory i once again wish you all a happy safe and hopeful 2022 and i would now like to open up the floor to questions thank you thank you ma'am while we wait for the queue i would uh, like to remind everyone that uh, should you need to raise a uh, question please select the raise hand option under the reaction tab of your zoom application we will call out your name and unmute your line to ask the question first question is from damanti garai from hsbc hi uh, good morning this is damanti from hsbc securities mumbai so thank you for the opportunity uh, and my first question is uh, regarding your launch of singly inter interchangeable product in the us so uh, since you launched the product in november uh, 2021 so uh, can you share like what kind of response you have seen uh, so far from your competitor in response to your interchangeable launch whether they have gone more aggressive in terms of pricing offer or some other uh, changes which you might have noticed in the market thank you Hi, Damanti. This is uh, Shreyas. Thanks for your question. I think the uh, as we've discussed in the past, many of these um, formulary listings happen in that August to uh, September, July to September time frame, and um, uh, we were very successful. Our partner Beatrice was able to win uh, a preferred status uh, with Express Scripts. in the uh, formulary contracting cycle which allowed us to get um, uh, a status displacing uh, lantus which was the preferred brand until then so clearly you know we've been able to displace some of the um, incumbents uh, and move them out from uh, uh, you know from that preferred status so we really see 22 as a as a place where we will be in a position to move the market in the in the manner that we projected so we are not really looking at a competitive uh, dynamics playing out during the course of the contracting cycle with the accounts that we've uh, been able to secure thank you shrihas and my second question is again on uh, simply uh, so obviously you have got uh, listed in some of the biggest uh, pbms in the us so any update on your uh, progress towards moving to uh, government program whether it's medicaid or medicare so if you looked at the launch strategy that uh, that beatrice came up with we came up with a with a dual brand strategy uh, and that dual brand strategy was essentially to address exactly the the kind of question you asked where we address patients in all uh, types of segments you know regardless of their insurance or their payment plans 
whether it is in the commercial space or the formulary listings, which is roughly about 30 or percent of the market, or uh, the Medicare uh, Part D, which you just referred to, which would be around 35 percent of the of the market, or the or the government supported programs uh, or the part um, uh, where the managed uh, Medicaid part of it, which would be another 15 to 17 percent. But with, with these uh, initiatives and the two brand strategy that we've come up with uh, and the uh, programs that Beatrice has launched, whether it is the senior citizens uh, you know, programs or the uh, Walgreens prescription saving programs, we are looking to cover uh, patients across the spectrum, uh, regardless of their co-pay strategies, so that we can really provide this affordable, uh, biosimilar, interchangeable insulin to patients in the US. So it's a very comprehensive strategy uh, to provide this insulin to, um, to people with diabetes in the US. Oh, thank you, I'll get back in the queue. Yeah. Thanks, Damianti. Our next question is from Tarang Agarwal from Woolwich Capital. Hello, good morning. Uh, two questions from my side. Uh, on appointment of Matthew, uh, just give me a second, please. Yes, on appointment of Matthew, if you could give us some broad brush on the scale of commercial capabilities that is being envisaged on the front end, and would the focus be concentrated on specific therapeutic areas? So let me respond to that, uh, Tarang. I think the, uh, if you've seen over the last uh, few quarters that we've um, uh, you know, come back, we've actually built our leadership team and leadership capabilities across all uh, parts of our uh, business. And um, you know, during the last three quarters, we've, we've set up our emerging markets commercial uh, front end uh, with a very strong leadership. In fact, even today's uh, clearance announcement saw that we've strengthened our commercial front end further in India, despite the fact that we've performed very, very uh, strongly in the current three quarters, which have exceeded the full year revenues of last year. Our conscious strategy has been that we expand our presence into advanced markets. And, and, and Matt uh, joining us is, uh, is basically to expand into the vision and the strategy that we had set for ourselves starting with our recombinant human insulin, which becomes our first product to get into the US market, and then to uh, get our wave two products across the various geographies where we intend to commercialize our products uh, across the world. We have always developed a, a global biosimilars business. And now that we've strengthened our presence in emerging markets in India, we're looking to expand this to the advanced uh, markets as well. So that's where the, um, now, Matt's uh, joining us with Sindar. Got it. Uh, the second on Semgli, if you could give us some strengths on uh, the strategy behind launching branded and unbranded uh, uh, Glargene. Yeah. So I just explained uh, on a previous question to Damanti. I think the important part was to cover uh, patients in, uh, or people in all types of um, insurance coverages that they would have. Um, uh, regardless of whether you know they have a particular formulary listing uh, and a coverage through a particular formulary or not, now because we may have a coverage with, with some of the largest uh, formularies, the national formulary listing with Express Scripts and with Prime Therapeutics, but there could be uh, people who would be in need of uh, of assembly or the insulin glargine interchangeable who may not be in this coverage, and that's where we brought in the second brand. Uh, which then allows us for a much wider, broader coverage, regardless of uh, any particular uh, uh, patient's uh, insurance coverage. So that's really the thought behind it. Though. Thank you. Next question from Surya Patra, Philip Capital. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the uh, opportunity, sir, and uh, congrats the good set of numbers. Uh, my first question is on uh, on the uh, the uh, the sequential swing in the biosimilar business. What we have witnessed uh, is it fair to believe that the larger chunk or chunk of that has come from the interchangeable assembly? And uh, a related question on that. So the interchangeable uh, branded version uh, assembly, what it has been launched at a double the price of uh, 
the earlier version. So how's, uh, what difference that we should see in terms of profit efficiency going ahead since this is going to be a kind of a very chunky contributor throughout this calendar year, uh, given the exclusivity that we are we would be having. So, Surya, I think uh, the two questions, um, the one, the, the sequential growth that we've talked about, I think we've had sequential growth uh, last three quarters we've essentially had sequential growth all through and and fair to say that uh, while we've had growth in all our segments across products i think a large part of our growth has also come because of the launch of the insulin glycine interchangeable in the us so that's a fair comment and we expect uh, some of this to stay as we get into uh, calendar 22 um, so this this kind of uh, in increased sequential uh, growth is something that um, uh, could be driven by uh, insulin glycine so that is a fair point the second aspect is uh, where when you talk about the markets and whether there is a uh, you know there is an opportunity to see that uh, these margin improvements uh, will will uh, will happen over time i'll defer that question to chini uh, to respond to that uh, second half of the question chini over to you on that part hmm. surya yeah hi yeah. just uh, sorry i didn't catch that second half of the question but uh, yes uh, the sequential growth is uh, for Q3 particularly is on the back of the bigger starting supplies of interchangeable insulin for the US markets. We see that picking up as you go into 2022. And of course, the profit shares that will flow through as we, uh, I mean, as this converts into in market sales. Because right now, what you see in our Q3 books is just a supply of product from uh, biologics to uh, Beatrice. Uh, in terms of pricing and profitability, we don't want to comment on that. And there is, um, I would say, I mean, there's always a gross price, that price, but we don't comment on pricing. Sure, sir. So, uh, uh, and uh, I think there are a couple of uh, new initiatives that has been taken by uh, uh, the company. So if you can just provide us some clarity on those uh, initiatives. Let's say, for example, uh, the PLI thing, what we have heard. Uh, so uh, can you share something about that? What is the kind of investment commitment? The nature of the product that you would be targeting, whether it is uh, the future initiatives on the PLI front is entirely fermentation oriented, something on that front. Uh, this is one, uh, uh, the new initiative that I would say. Secondly, uh, even on the, uh, the vaccine uh, foray through the Serum Institute uh, Alliance. So uh, how confident you are in terms of uh, optimally utilizing the targeted capacity of the serum that is around 10 crore doses per annum, starting from, let's say, second up, what you have mentioned. Uh, so that is the second. And similarly, the third point I would ask here is that uh, uh, how should one look at this 150 crore losses, what has been booked so far relating to the investment into the Bayakara. So if you can clarify these three new initiatives, then I think that will give a kind of a greater clarity about the next year's performance. Maybe Siddharth, you would like to address some of these queries? PLI uh, and uh, Bayakara and maybe Chini could talk about uh, the others. Sure, sure, uh, Kiran. So, Surya, uh, the PLI scheme, as you know, the government has announced the scheme, uh, the second scheme, which was not necessarily linked to any products. It was linked to, uh, it was a broad-based uh, scheme which covered uh, complex generics, biosimilars. Uh, and as a group, uh, we are investing heavily in CapEx, whether it's engine or biosimilars or generics. Uh, and in the category B, where we uh, where we were where we had applied, uh, we were the top uh, uh, company which was selected. And the benefit would be two fifty crores, uh, which will come over a period of six years on incremental sales. And the revenues uh, which will be eligible for this would be coming from both generics as well as uh, biosimilars. 
Now, we do, there's no change in strategy as far as investments are concerned in CapEx because we continue to invest, uh, let's say, in generics itself, whether it's in uh, fermentation or synthetic or peptides uh, facilities. And in insulin uh, for in Malaysia, uh, which obviously does not qualify for PLI uh, benefit, but uh, other antibody facilities in bio, bio, for biosimilars in India. Sure, sure. As far as Baikara's investment is concerned, uh, we have residual carrying value of investment uh, in our books of 25 crores, uh, which we expect uh, would be going through the PNL in the in the fourth quarter. Uh, Baikara is also in discussions with third party investors to raise a fund uh, to advance its pipeline. As we had said that, uh, you know, uh, Baikara will look at uh, external fundraise for future uh, R&D expenses. And we expect uh, some movement in the fourth quarter, after which uh, we will see that those expenses will not be on the consolidated uh, PNL. Awesome. My last question. Sorry, I'll take the vaccines question. Sure. Uh, uh, see, yes, of course, we see very strong demand for a vaccine portfolio. Initially, of course, there's a bias towards the COVID portfolio, then rolling into the next gen vaccines, and then progressively as we enter developed markets, which is our in our mid medium to long term plan. So convert that into financial terms. Initially, at the pricing, we believe it this could play out closer to the 100 million uh, uh, units could translate to close to $400 million of revenues and uh, profits, which is in line with our uh, core EBITDA margins, which is in the mid to high 30s. But whether you have uh, uh, started some marketing effort there, sir, why? Because uh, just uh, marketing around 10 crore or 100 million doses uh, from nowhere, uh, uh, whether it would be a staggered ramp up, that is why, or you have taken up your uh, marketing efforts seriously and uh, and hence, you are confident to, to utilize optimally even in the first year? Yes, there's a lot of joint commercialization efforts underway. And we believe that the revenues will start to play out right from the start of the merger. I mean, it's, right now, it will be through CTPL. And as CTPL merges into BBL, we yeah. will record the revenues. Sure, sir. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Surya. Next question is uh, from Sham Srinivasan from Golden Sachs. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for taking my question. Uh, just quick uh, three questions and I'll stop. Uh, so first one is on, uh, if you look at biosimilar pricing, uh, it has been again, uh, if you look at the latest 3Q data calendar uh, from CMS, another 6-7% decline QOQ. Uh, brands have taken 3% cut. So both the two sets of uh, both brands and biosimilars are taking significant cuts. If I were to plot the 15, 16 quarters, so uh, since biosimilars have launched in the US, we have seen up to 50% drop in prices. So just want your comment on how you look at pricing. In fact, if I look at Biocon, it has taken some of the lesser pricing. So how should we kind of look at price versus volume? What are some of the aspirations? Um, so that's question number one. Uh, question number two is on, uh, capital allocation. Uh, we've had some press speculation around uh, you looking at Mylan's uh, by similar business in a combined entity. Uh, if you could care to talk about that, or at least give us what are your capital allocation priorities are. And the third question is on the split of Bicon uh, Biologics revenue this quarter, EM versus DM, um, and how, how does this progress? Thank you. Hi, uh, Sham. Uh, thanks for your question. I think uh, let's talk a little bit about price erosion first. And I think the, uh, the important thing is that, uh, and I've talked about this before, the uh, general acceptance of biosimilars
market movies. So that's a positive. Seeing multiple, uh, you know, players enter the market and be successful now, there is, uh, you know, there is an acceptance of that. We also aren't seeing a very uh, steep decline. We, we were expecting, you know, with increased competition. That's the whole idea behind having biosimilars. That's the whole idea behind having competition to see that there is a more affordable option to the brand and we. We have expected this all along, and we've signaled that uh, right from the beginning. The U.S. has been a more uh, accommodating, steady um, uh, market where uh, price sanity has has prevailed. If you if you look overall, and we've basically uh, between Beatrice and us, our strategy has been to uh, to preserve uh, value as we've gone through. We've not chased market share uh, in pursuit of of that. We've not eroded value like many others. So we've continued to hold on to that, and our market shares have held steady in that uh, you know eight to ten percent uh, market uh, share range that we've had, whether it is in Fulfilla or whether it is in Ogivri. And we of course see it now inch forward with um, with Sendly with the uh, with the with the discussions we just had now recently. In Europe, we, we see a slightly different trend. Uh, it's a it's not a homogeneous market. It's a heterogeneous market. Several market archetypes, where you see that uh, you know where there is a single win tender, particularly in the Nordics, you would see a more aggressive pricing trend, and you would see someone a winner takes all kind of a strategy, and then there is more aggressive pricing in such markets when uh, you know in in certain cases. In most other markets uh, within Europe, you have also seen a position where there are mandated price reductions year on year once there is a first biosimilar launch. So some of these are predicated, some are, are, are pre-decided, uh, and we are seeing that uh, given that there is a 10 to 25 percent reduction, which you would have factored in, the market remains, uh, you know, the in line with where we had expected uh, it to move. Emerging markets sometimes have, uh, you know, uh, surprised us with the kind of, uh, uh, you know, price that they have held on to, and that's where we've also seen uh, uh, encouraging signs for the products that we've brought to market. Kiran talked about signing 20 new partnerships in recent times in emerging markets, and we are encouraged with the response that we've received in. Uh, in several markets and the partners that we are working with. So on the whole, I would say price erosion is uh, is along the expected lines and really something that biosimilars were expected to do when they, uh, as, a, as, a, as a, a basic principle uh, to bring them into the market. So that was the first question. Let me answer the third question that, um, that you, um, that you talked about where it, uh, I think you asked us about the, EM versus uh, DM split uh, in uh, for the quarter, and I think uh, what's uh, what's been our case so far is with the uh, launch of the emer uh, interchangeable insulin in the US, we are starting to uh, to see that uh, the needle start to move towards the developed markets, but it's still at this stage. I would say, given that we've had a strong emerging market performance, uh, it's more or less at this point around that fifty percent mark. Uh, so it's balanced still. Uh, we expect it to probably start moving as we gain uh, more supplies into the U.S. with uh, with, with assembly and other products. Uh, I, I will uh, leave the uh, the question on speculation out at this time uh, because there's no point in responding to speculation. But unless Arun or, um, or Kiran want to respond to anything beyond that. Um, maybe the question then on capital allocation uh, shares. There are the priorities. Can you respond to the capital allocation part of it? I shall. I mean, uh, of course, there is uh, uh, two uh, types of investments needed to be successful in the biosimilar market, or let's say three if you add the commercial infrastructure. So the R&D, the CapEx, and uh, the commercial infrastructure. As you've seen, we've been investing quite significantly in building a CapEx um, uh, capital infrastructure to service both the developed and the ROW markets. So a significant amount of investment has already been made. We expect that to play out over the next two years as we commercialize, as we commission one of the large scale uh, monoclonal antibody facilities in the coming fiscal and another facility into in FI24, FI25 timeframe. 
uh, R and D investments. You will see that going up as we um, bring some of our wave two molecules into the clinic. But clearly, there is a lot of investments going into this, both in building the capital infrastructure, uh, capex, and the R and D investments needed to uh, give us that long, medium to long term growth from wave two and wave three molecules. Okay. Thank you, Jenny. Thanks, John. Uh, next question from Prakash Agarwal, Access Capital. Yeah, am I audible? Hi. Yes. Yes. Yeah, hi. Good morning to all. Uh, the question is on R&D. So we saw, uh, you know, in the last two quarters, uh, R&D is kind of coming off. It's down 5% YOI nine-month basis. Just wanted to understand, uh, uh, you know, how do we see this for the rest of the year as well as next year? What would be the outlook? Uh, and is uh, is there any update on the Sandoz pipeline? Uh, we had talked about that around calendar 22, we will give some color. So uh, these two questions, please. So, uh, uh, Prakash, I think uh, we talked about it in Kiran's opening remark as well. Uh, our R&D pipeline has been quite robust. We've been, in fact, uh, you know, we're looking to uh, get uh, our products into the clinic this quarter. So you will, uh, you know, you're right in uh, noting that our R&D expenses so far have been, um, you know, more or less, you know, not as high as we would have expected. That's because our products have not hit the uh, clinical stage until now. But this quarter, we are expecting them uh, to be in the in the clinic, and you will see that there'll be a big catch up in terms of the um, R&D development investments that we will be making. Uh, once these products move into the market. Uh, in terms of the Sandoz pipeline, we had uh, talked about uh, these products being uh, uh, under development and we will uh, you know, disclose the uh, to, uh, to the investors uh, once we've reached that stage where we can talk about them uh, publicly. Prakash, uh, any follow-up questions on that? Yeah, am I audible? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. No, so uh, any outlook we can give for the R&D expense next year, uh, like we always do about 12 to 15 percent is has been our outlook for uh, fiscal 22. Do you want to respond to that? Uh, hi, Prakash. Uh, we will be in a better position to give you guidance for FI. 23 as we draw up our full year plan for next year. But yes, we see this trending upwards. Okay. And is there any update on the RH insulin uh, progress? I mean, I, 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 I learned from the investor deck that, you know, it is progressing. Uh, what are the timelines we are looking at in terms of going to the next level and approval if all goes well? So in terms of our uh, RH insulin program, there are multiple uh, products that are uh, in the uh, human insulin, uh, uh, I would say, franchise. Uh, and we are developing all of these products to bring them to the US. At this stage, these products, uh, you know, we progressed uh, with, uh, with uh, the soluble uh, product and we moved that uh, for, for discussion with the agency. We are working to bring the other products as well. Uh, uh, to the agency and we will uh, of course um, uh, discuss in more detail once um, uh, we're ready to have a more uh, complete conversation on that Prakash. but we are moving on that um, you know as planned okay and lastly uh, you know a mix of uh, you know the conversation we had now so r and d going to increase a bit uh, cost structures given that we are you know planning to expand in uh, you know vaccine commercialization, et cetera, will go up. At the same time, we have higher value insulin glycine. I mean, on a net basis, I assume it will add more value. So what is the margin trajectory that we are looking for next year, given you know we have some big products as well, as well as a big scale up of future products? Prakash, I'll take that. Yeah, um, for the biosimilars business, we see core EBITDA margins uh, I mean, sustained or improving as you go forward 
with I mean both the addition of the vaccines business and the increased mix of developed market sales uh, to our total sales. So those two things will help to maintain and grow our net uh, core EBITDA margins. On R and D, I'm not yet in a position to give you specific numbers, because so. Okay, this is despite assuming R and D expense will increase. We are uh, we are no, guiding the core EBITDA margin is sorry sorry Prakash. The core EBITDA margin is before R and D. Okay, okay, got it. Okay, thank you, thank you for your answers. Thanks, Prakash. Next question is from Yashtana. Uh, I thought it was from. Yes, please. Yeah, I'm audible now. Yeah. Yeah. So, good morning, team, and congratulations on a good set of numbers. Uh, so my first question is that uh, Vatris and Biocon, uh, so we have won the litigation against Sanofi for Lantis Solo Star, and uh, we had mentioned in the press release that the market for uh, Lantis is one point four billion dollars, and Lantis Solo Star is around five point one billion dollars. So my question is, uh, uh, so I want to understand the addressable total addressable market for this glazing product. So it would be around six point five billion or one point four billion only for the Lantis. So that's that's my first question. So there are uh, two different uh, products there. There is we have a Lantus is sold as a, a from in terms of Solo Star as a as a pen a pre filled pen yes, and they also sell it as a as a ten ml vial which is also called as Lantus. And uh, uh, Beatrice and Biocon Biologics are the only uh, player in the market which has both these products. So we would uh, essentially have uh, a complete offering of products and we would have the full addressable market. Of $6.5 billion, right? Yeah, th those are the full reported numbers, the actual numbers will be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. got it, got it. Thank you. And uh, the second question is a, a little product specific question. So a, a drug called uh, Victoza, who sales around uh, 2.8 to $3 billion. Uh, so I believe the patent is expiring in 2023. And the API is uh, Liraglutide, uh, which I think we have filed in September 2021. So my question is, uh, what is the status on that approval and what kind of economic opportunity can that present to us? So let me take that, uh, you know, it's uh, covered under the product is being developed by the generics business. Uh, it's a very large product uh, uh, in the US and Europe. And uh, we have filed the DMF and we'll soon be filing our NDA in the US. And uh, we hope to be in the market in line with the second uh, uh, the second round of companies will be launching because there are only uh, there are a couple of settlements for day one launch. So we should be in the market in FI25 for this product. FI25. And okay. Uh, so my third question is uh, around the novel biologic segment. So I went through an interview of the Equilium CEO, Mr. Bruce Steele, and where he mentioned that early next year they will initiate trials for Itilizumab for acute GVHD. And if uh, those trials are successful, uh, they will, uh, uh, it will be approved for acute first line treatment of acute GVHD, which is more than a $500 million market in the US, what he mentioned. And uh, then I went through the Equilium annual report that mentions uh, that there are a few milestone payments that we can receive upon, uh, like we can receive upon the approval and sale of this drug, uh, which is, uh, I think, around $550 million. And I think we also have exclusive supply arrangement with Equilium. So my question is, uh, what does uh, the approval of Itlozumab uh, present for uh, Biocon in economic terms? Well, there are uh, milestones linked to the various development uh, stages. So there would be, uh, you know, the and the amount that you mentioned is from various indications. Now, the first or the most advanced indication is acute GVHD, which is also an orphan indication. And we expect uh, the, once the trial starts this year, we'll be able to, uh, Equilium will be able to make good progress in the next couple of years. And uh, there are milestones linked to uh, filing and approval, filing of BLA and the approval. And then there are royalties uh, uh, which are applicable on sales. And uh, we will be supplying the product. The product itself will be manufactured by Biocon Biologics since it's an antibody. And we'll be supplying to Equilium uh, at a cost plus markup. Okay. So uh, can you quantify uh, any numbers in terms of uh, 
milestone payments or anything like that yes it's a little premature to comment on the payment because we are still few years away okay sure so uh, thank you these are my questions and best of luck to the team thank you yash next questions from uh, nitin shak shak dev from green capital nitin please unmute your line hi good morning to the management and uh, good morning uh, to uh, mrs kiran majumdar show as well i have two simple questions uh my first question is in relation to the strategic alliance between biocon biologics and the serum institute life sciences does the management feel that in terms of the growth of the communicable diseases and the vaccine market seems to be far higher in the future versus the growth in biosimilars can you sort of come into that point please i don't think uh, it would suggest that uh, communicable diseases are much uh, you know are, are likely to grow much faster in terms of the need for vaccines than biosimilars these are absolutely two two separate categories i think as a company that is focused on global healthcare up until now we were really focused on non communicable diseases and this pandemic actually shone the uh you know the spotlight on uh, communicable diseases which we had not really looked at seriously and we believe that uh, you know in, in in the future it's important as a global healthcare player to cover both communicable and non communicable diseases i think each one of these businesses has its own growth potential its own growth segments and we believe that obviously from our business point of view our focus is on uh the uh, uh pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical opportunities as the primary focus for us as a company but we also believe that vaccines can add to this focus and make us truly uh, a global health company focused on both aspects of uh, disease thank you ma'am uh, my second question is in relation to the specific uh, partnership with uh, adagio therapeutics to manufacture and commercialize the neutralizing novel antibody so i just wanted to get a sense of what are the specific products uh, which are going to be launched for the prevention or the treatment does the management have a sense of the product line at this point in time well the principal product is a product called adg20 which was a mono uh, 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 engineered monoclonal antibody for the uh, treatment of uh, obviously covid 19 and at this point in time of course its efficacy on all previous variants was very high and uh, therefore it was considered to be a very differentiated antibody and because it was a uh, an intramuscular jab as opposed to a iv infusion it it had a very strong differentiated profile uh, it had high efficacy with all previous uh, uh, variants as well as a very differentiated drug delivery profile which is why we believe that this was a very good partnership and it is a very good partnership uh, recently they had a setback because the efficacy vis-a-vis the omicron virus was substantially reduced however they have also uh, you know shared with the in in the public domain that the reduction in efficacy of their antibody is no different to that of the two antibodies the vir gsk and the az antibody uh, cocktails which also have shown a re- reduction in the uh, efficacy to treat omicron patients so they believe that they are in, they are on par with these other antibody pr- preparations and they would like to now actually have an adaptive trial design that can actually um, enhance the dose form of their current dosage to see if they can actually deal with omicron in a better way so i think that's the reason why they've had a bit of a uh, halt in their clinical trial program but having said that uh, you know they have indicated to us that adg20 continues to be a very important opportunity a very important product and as you know the pandemic is not over as yet we don't know what variant will come next but at this point in time we believe that this pandemic does require treatment interventions 
And we believe that antibody treatments are a very important part of this treatment uh, required for dealing with the pandemic. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the clarifications. That's all from my side and all the best for the next financial year. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, next one is from Samir uh, from Mobile Sandy. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my first question is on ASPART. Uh, how are you thinking about uh, the CRL um, you know, issued by FDA? And is it connected with the six open observations? And by what time do you think you'll be able to, uh, to resolve this and get the approval? Hi, Samir. Uh, the um, yes, uh, CRL uh, was a disappointment for us. Uh, really, we've, uh, we've gone through the CRL letter and there are uh, essentially two aspects to it. The agency came back uh, with, uh, to us and said that uh, there was uh, a particular uh, <clears throat> diluent. A diluent is used alongside the aspart vial that we have. And that is given to patients who are of very low body weight, particularly pediatric patients. And they, they would probably need, they need this diluent to dilute their dose so that they can take that uh, uh, you know, rapid acting analog. And they wanted more information of that diluent, which, which is essentially uh, what the injection along with some uh, excipient. So it doesn't have the product at all. So it's a separate uh, uh, you know, uh, product in itself. So that is something that we have to provide more information to them, which we will uh, we are working to provide. And the second one was the, second one was the updates on the inspection uh, that uh, we had provided them in terms of the CAPA responses that we had given them. And they wanted us to provide us a, a completeness of that uh, data. And we will be submitting that uh, information to them. We have been in uh, uh, correspondence and dialogue with the agency to understand, the agency to understand they would guide on, they would guide on something that is currently ongoing. And uh, once we're done with that, we should have a more clearer picture how we will be able to and how quickly we'll be able to resolve the CRA. Yeah, thanks. Uh, but uh, just uh, putting these things together, do you think you'd be able to secure the approval in time for contracting for 2023 or there's a risk that we slip into later part of this year? So the, the way so, the way was scheduled is that we were looking uh, to be in time for the second half of the year and uh, we, we expect to be there uh, with that. We will, of course, know once we interact with the agency, uh, but to, to give a commitment on behalf of when the agency will decide would, uh, would, uh, would be actually uh, going too far. Uh, but we are hopeful and uh, let's see how the discussions progress. The second question is on insulin glargine. When you have done the contracting already for 2022, uh, how do we think about the volumes and the pricing? Um, are these open? You just have sort of a broad, you know, umbrella sort of contract, or, or are they more specific? Uh, if you can just share your thoughts uh, around this. Well, these contracts are drawn up by our partner Beatrice, along with uh, with the various uh, customers that they've got. So you know, we may not be able to share a lot of detail around it, but these are uh, contracts that are uh, executed for a, a contracting term. Uh, you know, which is uh, in some cases a year, some cases two years, which could be you know defined as such. But we believe that these are uh, you know we we're not looking for. Uh, uh, a quarter on quarter change of situations like this, we believe this to be a sustainable uh, revenue stream for us, a volume stream for us, which is why uh, you know, we've guided that some of these things will be um, you know, a much more steady going forward for us. Okay, thanks. One, one final question from my side, if I may. It's on the generic business. Uh, so, Sid, if you can just respond to uh, parts. One is, I believe you have uh, spent 600 crores on the WISAC uh, facility. So, what kind of asset turnover uh, can, you, can we expect from this and over what time period? And second is, on the PAI inspection that was done uh, a few months back, uh, any update on that uh, final approval? Thank you. 
Sure, Samir. So the asset turn is difficult to quantify because the output from Vizac facility would go both for our API business as well as for our formulations business. And we do have an existing facility in Bangalore. So this, uh, the Vizac facility will augment that capacity in Bangalore. But uh, as you know, immunosuppressant has been our biggest growth driver in the last couple of years. And we are capacity constrained and we definitely see a huge growth coming in uh, from this investment. And we will be in the future also looking at adding more fermentation capacity in uh, Vizac, uh, which is beyond immunosuppressant. So obviously being a greenfield investment, there's a lot of uh, infra cost uh, or the capex uh, on infra was in, in included in the 600. But uh, in terms of asset turn, uh, we, we difficult to quantify, but it, you, know, you can look at our API business asset turn overall was in the range of 1.25 to 1.5. And for the formulations, uh, it's a little over two. So I don't expect it to be anything lesser than that. Once fully commercialized. Uh, thanks to that, and also on PAI inspection. But the uh, PAI inspection PAI was concluded uh, for our formulations facility immediately after that. We received the approval for mycophenolic acid uh, in November, December of 2021. We have a couple of more drugs uh, which are pending approval, and we actually expect to get uh, some of these approvals during the fourth quarter. Okay, great. Thank you. That's it from us. Thank you. Thanks, Amir. Uh, next question is from Harit uh, from Spark Capital. Harit, please unmute your line. Harit, uh, are you on? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry about that. Good morning. Uh, thanks for taking my questions. Uh, my first question is on Aspart. Uh, so, when I look at our uh, uh, launches, uh, biosimilar launches in regulated markets in the past, like Peckville, Grastim, Trastizumab, and Insulin Glargine, uh, those were followed by successful launches of these products in India and, and some of the emerging markets. So for uh, as part, can we expect a launch in India uh, in the near term? I see that there are uh, fairly large uh, brands uh, from the innovator in this in, in, in as part in India. So Harit, we, we've always developed a global franchise, whichever product we've picked. Now, I don't want to specifically talk about a particular market, but whichever products we've picked, uh, you know, the, the idea has been to build a, a global franchise with each of the molecules that we brought to the market. Um, it could be depending on, uh, on the business cases of a particular market or the, or, the, or the specialties of a particular market that they could be timed differently. But the intent would be to see that it makes sense to bring them across. All right. Uh, 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 second question is on novel biologics. Uh, uh, I see that we've been booking some revenues in this segment, uh, not a very material number, but 10 to 15 crores uh, in the last uh, two or three quarters. So what, what exactly is this related to uh, any, any specific programs? And is this part of the licensing income that we're disclosing? So I'll take that question. So this is actually intercompany billing that is built from uh, the India to uh, to Baikara US and Baikara being an associate, this intercompany billing does not get eliminated. So the corresponding leg is sitting in R&D cost and in, in a share of loss under Baikara. So this is not really a third party income. Okay. No, I think there is also a, uh, he may be referring to Itolizumab sales. No, no, Kiran, what he referred is right. This is biofusion billing to Baikara. The company okay. billing. Okay. Yeah, yeah. and, and uh, last one, uh, again, an accounting related question. What is our current stake in Adagio? And, and I'm also trying to understand the rationale for uh, taking the MTM losses through the PNL and not through the other comprehensive income. Can you? Harit, hi, I'll take the question. Uh, it's, uh, we got a small minority stake in the business. We have invested $5 million in uh, 
in a adagio don't have the specific percentage but it's a small minority uh, percentage the uh, thing of doing it through the pnl we saw this as a short term investment and uh, thought we'll uh, take it through the pnl and exit this fiscal but the price has moved quite quite a bit as you saw in q2 we had gains uh, playing out because of adagio and this quarter we have a huge loss so it's something i mean in that respect say that we should not have uh, we should have uh, not taken it to the pnl but it is a decision we have made uh, and we'll be looking to exit from this investment in the near term once the price stabilizes got it thanks jimmy that's all from my side thanks harit the next one is from uh, vikram agarwal sc stock brokers Uh, good morning, team. Uh, just one small question. In the recent past, uh, one of the prime reasons why uh, the results had suffered was because of logistical issues. Issues such as due to COVID, hospitals in the US were not able to treat, you know, major therapies, you know, like, uh, diseases like cancer and the other things, and delays in US FDA approvals. so what do you think is the situation of these and can you comment if these problems have abated or uh, we can expect certain similar problems arising in the future also thank you so we can uh, you know some of these logistics issues as i think if you noted kiran's original uh, the initial remarks i think uh, the pandemic really you know just when we had thought that it's behind us it's actually come up with a new variant each time and each time it come you know it's really impacted <clears throat> the way we've uh, tried to return to normalcy as a as a community and uh, you know likewise in the us as well where uh, footfalls uh, to hospitals have continued to be uh, challenged right <laughs> to the of the um, non critical treatments as much as they can of course uh, you know whatever is critical has to happen uh, but some of these things have impacted they continue to slow things down but uh, you know uh, eventually these things will have to come back to normalcy at this stage we do see uh, some tra you know trailing impact of these uh, uh, you know uh, delays because of the uh, uh, covid uh, impediments that are there across the world Uh, but i think we are as a as a community we are learning to deal with it is is the way we would see it uh great thank you and all the best for the future thanks vikram thanks vikram next one is from uh, nitya from bernstein hi uh, thank you so two questions one on assembly so assembly uh, shrihas you had mentioned that you have the interchangeable product you have the branded product as well so question that is mylan likely to retain the sales force into 2022 as well or is that something they're retiring because i assume your profit share is net of the sales and marketing expenses if they didn't quite catch your question i think your was your question that uh, given that we have a two brand strategy what happens to our sales force probably my line was bad is that the question so the question is is viatris uh, retaining the sales force in 2022 and beyond and the reason i'm asking is i'm assuming your profit share is net of the sales and marketing expenses yeah so i think the um, uh, in terms of the uh, beatrice's uh, commercial strategy um, i wouldn't want to comment too much on that that's best left to them to address but but clearly we are looking at uh, uh, you know uh, glargine as not just one product and the uh, and the formulary having uh, you know been being listed in some of the top formularies being the uh, end of the line we're looking at more products to follow and uh, clearly we are looking at uh, a larger subscription than what we've got today so we don't uh, necessarily see this as a, as a be all in terms of where it is we're looking at uh, uh, a more wider presence than uh, what we've created we see this as a beginning so wouldn't necessarily comment on uh, on the sales force increase decrease uh, specifically that may be a vetus uh, specific question but um, 
but we see this as a beginning of um, of a franchise rather than just one win or a one product uh, situation in terms of uh, how our profits are accounted i'll, I'll let chini uh, comment on that uh, over to you chini on that nitya we had actually clarified in the past the profit share with uh, we had this is based on gross profit and selling and marketing expenses is not a deductible that we share it understood thank you the second question was on aspart i think in the last earnings call lily had commented that uh, the aspart contracting is far more in fast acting insulin contracting is far more complicated it happens along with premix uh, insulins in a more bundled format uh, your reaction to you know do you see this as a challenge to adopting uh, your aspart when it's in the market i don't uh, specifically recollect that conversation but uh, we've not heard of anything specific netya that uh, could be a challenge that uh, uh, that is specific to as part contracting we do believe that uh, we will have to be uh, there at the table we also believe that um, uh, we will uh, you know have a product which meets all the expectations um, of the agency and will be amongst the uh, you know will be the first interchangeable Uh, uh analog as well rapid acting analog so we believe we will have what it takes to be uh, uh approved and uh, and be chosen over the competition so uh, i don't uh, know or i can't recollect any specific challenges that uh, that you are referring to thank you shri because i was referring to what uh, lily said in the last earnings calls about they are contracting happening in a more bundled fashion along with premixes in the fast starting insulin category but um, that's what i was referring to okay. thank you thank you so much and all the best thank you thanks natya next one is from uh, chintan cheda from quest uh, investment advisors yeah hi good morning hello am i audible yes yeah good morning to the team and thanks for taking my question so my first question is related to simply so just wanted to understand like up to what level of market share in the us this malaysian facility can fulfill the requirements at existing capacity and this uh, facility had some tax benefits in phase 1 so <coughs> will the same be applicable for phase 2 or future expansions I, i think in terms of the uh, uh, you know the ability to supply the us market i think we've got um, a, a very uh, good capacity to supply the us market and we've um, we've said that in the past as well that we've um, we've got a very uh, we built a global scale uh, facility in malaysia which is a very large integrated facility for drug substance drug product and pen assembly and we've continue to expand that uh, facility as well in fact today that we've also shared that uh, you know encouraged by the responses that we've seen and the impending uh, aspart approval uh, in the near future we will be making even um, further investments on that site so that uh, you know we can cater to even a higher market share than than we're looking for today so we're very confident in terms of the ability to supply the market and we are looking for in fact uh, a much more aggressive play in terms of volume share as we get into uh, more products um, uh, ahead of time so so clearly um, uh, in a very strong position on the on the capacity front to feed the market and tax benefits what were the tax benefits and do they stick if we go further for further expansions yeah chintan has clarified that yes we do have very good tax uh, uh, we got a long 15 year tax holiday with uh, link to our phase 1 investments we are engaged with the malaysian authorities for incentive supporting the phase 2 investment okay uh, yeah yeah thanks for that and second question is related to aspart so for the uh, eu market we have the approval in hand so have we gone for the launch in that market and if yes then what has been the performance so far in this financial year so chintan we've got the approval in the eu and which is why we are very confident about the science and uh, which is why we are looking for uh, 
for the right time to launch the product. At this time, uh, you know, we are uh, working, uh, Beatrice is working out on the right launch strategy and the, the right markets to launch. And as I've said before, Europe is not one uh, country, it's a heterogeneous market. And it's about uh, timing uh, of which product to launch in which markets. So they are working on putting that commercial strategy together. And given that we've uh, you know, crossed the bridge in terms of the approval part of it, uh, we will be, you know, uh, putting together that strategy with Beatrice to bring the product to uh, to Europe uh, once that's put together. Okay, okay. Thanks a lot. That's it from my side. Thanks, Chintan. Next question is from Patrick Sattelhofer from Atlantic Lion Investments. Um, good morning. Just one bigger picture question. Uh, how do you see the biosimilar partnership for Beatrice and given how important biosimilars are becoming to your overall results, how do you strategically think about your ability to control your own destiny here versus having to rely on Beatrice, for whom this is a much smaller part of their business, executing for you? Thank you. Arun, would you want to respond to that? Sure, but Patrick, uh, if you look at our portfolio of biosimilars, we, our initial portfolio was partnered with Beatrice and they continue to be a strong partner for us on our initial wave of products. We've also talked about our increased R&D spends going forward, which essentially reflects the progress we've made on our future portfolio which is not partnered with Beatrice. So clearly, as our future portfolio matures, uh, you know, we would be, of course, uh, more, I would say, uh, balanced in terms of our uh, commercial channels, what goes through Beatrice and what goes directly, uh, you know, through us. And we talked about making initial steps in building out our commercial footprint in advanced markets through some of the senior hires. And this is the first step towards that destiny that you talked about, about uh, being completely vertically integrated across R&D manufacturing and commercial for our future portfolio. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Next one is from Vipul Shah from Samangal Investment. Hi, am I audible? Yes. So my question is, uh, what will be the capex for set, uh, expansion for Malaysian facilities, and uh, what is the financial performance uh, of the Malaysian facilities? Uh, what is the capacity utilization? What is the EBITDA level performance? If you can comment, that will be very helpful. <clears throat> Hi, Vipul. So the Malaysia expansion will come within our overall capex plans that I mean capex spend of about 100 to 150 million per year. So we look to fund the Malaysia expansion within this overall capex allocation. If you look at Malaysia's performance for the quarter, this has been a very good quarter because we've had positive EBITDA and a break even at the PBTPAT line or near break even as profit shares accrue from the sales of assembly in the US, we see this trending upwards and Malaysia moving to uh, full profitability in FY23. So a follow-up to that. So should we assume that uh, Malaysia will at least break even uh, from here on for all subsequent uh, quarters and years? Yes, uh, we strongly believe that Malaysia will be profitable going forward from Q4 onwards. Thank you and all the best for you. Thanks, Apul. Uh, next one is from uh, Ashutosh. Ashutosh, please unmute your line. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. My question is, how do you see Biocon different from today's Biocon in less uh, in next say ten years? Thank you.
Turn on your mute. Thanks for that question. As you know, um, Biocon sees itself as a fully integrated global uh, biopharma, biosimilar company. And I think one of the uh, missing capabilities we have is really to be a strong, to have a strong commercial engine for advanced markets. And I think in the next 10 years, we expect ourselves to be amongst the leading uh, biosimilars companies globally as a fully integrated uh, player in this particular segment with a very large portfolio of products. We expect to have one of the largest portfolio of biosimilars catering to global markets and being dominant in many, many of these markets, especially uh, some of the key uh, global markets, which are the advanced markets and key emerging markets. That's how we want to see ourselves. Thank you. Thanks, Ashutosh. I think um, the next one is a follow up from Surya from Philip Capital. Yeah, uh, so uh, just to follow on, on the on the uh, small molecule side, so this immunosuppression dedicated facility, what we are uh, uh, we have set up. So you know, with that, obviously, we will have a kind of a meaningful posi global positioning. So can you just uh, share uh, what is the current positioning in the global market so far? APIs are concerned. Uh, and uh, the competitive position versus Chinese players and uh, post this plant, what equation that we can have. And we know that there is a positive trend that is also uh, likely to support that uh, the alternate Chinese source uh, equation, which is a kind of favorable wave, I believe. So given all that, uh, what expectations that you are having out of this? Uh, minus suppression uh, portfolio and uh, let's say even the fermentation capability as a whole that you have built. Thanks, Surya. Uh, I will defer this uh, question to Neil, who heads our commercial for our API business. Yeah. Thanks, Surya, for the question. So Surya, we already have a very uh, well-established uh, client base on immunosuppressant and also our clients are well-spread globally. And today we have large market share uh, be in advanced markets, uh, emerging markets, as well as domestic markets in India. And many of our existing immunosuppressants, we are unable to fulfill the market demand. So we believe the additional uh, capacities that would kick in with our uh, investment it would fulfill those demands and our leadership market position that we have would become even stronger. And you're right with your thought that while, uh, you know, there has been a dearth of uh, capacity for past 24 months, we believe that uh, we would be able to overcome the, uh, uh, you know, uh, sentiments against China and get a larger market share than what we have today. In fact, if I may just add uh, for the immunosuppressants, in fact, the we are working with many Chinese companies to sell immunosuppressants for the Chinese markets. So that's a, you can understand that if the Chinese companies are buying from India, that shows the uniqueness and differentiated uh, 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 part of this molecule where uh, there are not many companies locally who's able to get the drug at the same quality that they are able to source from us. Sure, sir. So is it uh, free from China kind of uh, product category in terms from of? Our, uh, yeah, from a logistics perspective or supply chain dependency, we are, this is not dependent on China. Sure, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Surya. I think this was the last question for the day. We thank you all again for joining us today. If you have any additional question, please feel free to reach out to Ashwarya or myself. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again next quarter. Have a good day.